a 1500 kilogram cannon is used to shoot a 15 kilogram cannonball horizontally from the top of a cliff. If the cannonball is shot with a speed of 90 meters per second, what is the cannon's recoil speed? This problem is actually the same as the explosion problem we did in the last video. In this scenario, instead of energy being released from a spring, we have energy released from gunpowder. If we ignore friction, the net force on the whole system is zero. That means we have conservation of momentum. The initial momentum equals to the final momentum. Before the cannonball is shot, the whole system is at rest, so the initial momentum is zero. Afterwards, the cannonball has momentum m times v. The cannon also has momentum mass m times v, the final velocity we don't know. We are looking for that final velocity. And then we can find the final velocity to be negative 0.9 meters per second. We were using the to the right velocity 90 as positive. So this negative velocity means it's in the opposite direction. It is uh, to the left. Now, of course, for recoil speed, speed is always a positive number. So the recoil speed is only 0.9 meters per second. There's no sign for it. The initial momentum is zero. So the final momentum is also zero. This means that after the explosion, the cannon and the cannonball must have equal amount but opposite direction momentum, so they can cancel. From this, we can also see why we need the cannon to be much, much heavier than the cannonball. In order to give the cannonball the same amount of momentum, a heavier cannon would have a smaller and safer recoil speed. In this case, the cannon has a mass that is 100 times that of the cannonball. So its speed is 1 one hundredth of the cannonball's speed. Remember that in the last unit, we learned about conservation of energy. Why don't we use conservation of energy for explosion problems like this one? In explosion problems, energy is still conserved. The kinetic energy gain of the cannon and the cannonball comes from the chemical energy released by the explosion. However, if we don't know how much energy is released in this explosion, we won't be able to use that information. And even if we know how much energy is released, we still won't know how the total energy is shared by the two objects, unless if we use conservation of momentum. Another thing is, in an explosion problem like this one, Although the net force on the whole system is zero, the net force on the cannon and the net force on the cannonball are obviously not zero. The force from the explosion causes the cannon and the cannonball to push on each other with equal and opposite action and reaction force pair. These internal forces, the force between two objects inside a system, cancel each other when you look at the whole system. However, the friction on the cannon by the ground is not an internal force and it's not cancelled. So in order for us to be able to use momentum conservation, there has to be negligible friction between the cannon and the ground. Usually in such problems, we deal with objects on wheels, boats on water, something on wet ice, or in mid-air, so we can neglect friction. Otherwise, the problems may ask you for speeds immediately after an explosion or collision. So even if there is some friction, we can say that uh, the explosion or collision happens very quickly. So the speeds immediately afterwards, before the friction slows things down too much, can still be estimated by momentum conservation. Problems similar to this one include scenarios such as uh, a person runs and jumps off a cart. A person throws something off a cart or a boat. The jumping or throwing uses calories, releasing energy just like an explosion. The system starts as one piece and then breaks into two pieces. 
we can use conservation of momentum for these problems.